Has anybody seen all the lyrics or heard all the lyrics to that song before? Two-thirds of the Christmas hymns and carols that are sung, we don't use but two-thirds of the songs. And to me, that's a mistake because the story is in the words. And uh, the words portray an idea that comes through the picture the words give us. Now, we're going to look at Luke 2 here for a minute, and then we're going to talk about uh, this season we call Christmas, the Advent season. Luke 2, chapter 2. At that time, the Roman Emperor Augustus decreed that a census should be taken throughout the Roman Empire. This was the first census taken when Quirinius was governor of Syria. All returned to their own ancestral towns to register for the census. And because Joseph was a descendant of King David, he had to go to Bethlehem in Judah, David's ancient home. He traveled there from the village of Nazareth to Galilee. He took with him Mary, his fiancée, who was now obviously pregnant. Now, we all remember the story of the angel coming to Mary. And Mary's attitude towards the angel was, as the Lord wants, I'll do it. Let me be the handmaiden to the Lord. Now, we must not forget that in the years that came after Gabriel talked to Mary, there was some very specific things that Mary could not escape. One was the rumors of being pregnant way too soon. The stigma that she received socially, because in the culture of the day, Mary was about as wrong as you could get in family life. And everybody looked at her and understood she didn't do things right. And it affected conversations. It affected how your neighbors related to you. Mary bore that. Let's say Mary bore her cross there. And she lived through that her whole life with that stigma. Reading on in chapter 2. And while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. Mary gave birth to her first child, a son. She wrapped him snugly in strips of cloth and laid him in a manger. Now, I know some of you know what a manger is. Is there anybody who doesn't? Dave, don't answer. What is a manger? What is it specifically? It was the feed trough for the livestock. A manger. Now, do you think a manger that is used as a feed trough for livestock would be clean and tidy and polished and spit-shined, much less empty? Imagine there might have been a little bit of grain in the bottom of that trough that Jesus laid on that formed to him. Now, God sent Mary into that role, and Jesus laid in a manger. We have a young girl now who's pregnant, out of wedlock, a baby born in a cattle feed trough, continuing on. That night there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. Now, I want to acknowledge at this point that Diane did a marvelous job of explaining and connecting the sheep and the shepherds into the story. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared among them and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terrified, but the angel reassured them, don't be afraid. He said, I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. And you will recognize him by this sign. 
you'll find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth lying in a cattle feed trough. Now the Bible uses the word manger, but think of that in that earthy, very simple, rustic, this is all we have kind of manner. Jesus, the baby, God in diapers, laying in a cattle feed trough. Now, in this story, when the angels are explaining here, suddenly the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven. What just happened to the story? The armies of heaven. That's describing the warriors, the fighters, the revelers, as we learned a couple of weeks ago, the marvelers in the heavens, the messengers in the heavens, came forward praising God and saying, Glory to God in highest heaven and peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. Now, is that what the Christmas song says? On, and peace on earth to those in whom God is pleased? It says peace on earth to men. But the real story is with whom God is pleased. Now, we're going to move away from the Bible here. And we're going to talk about something for a second. I want to have a very casual discussion. You guys interact in this with it. What is Christmas about? At the lowest common denominator, what is it about? Miles. The birth of Christ. The celebration of the gift God has given to man. Another possibility. What is Christmas all about? Pardon? I, I was checking to make sure I heard you right, and you said Santa Claus and gifts. Absolute cast in concrete stark truth. Santa Claus and gifts. What else is Christmas about? Family together, eating a meal shared, going to a relative's house. Um, that time we spend that we long for every winter. Nancy. Salvation. Because without Christmas birth, there is no salvation. What else is Christmas about? Deborah. I'm totally enjoying that as your answer because I relate to that as a teenager. You two, if you don't get along and behave, I'm going to kill you both. Well, Mom, we're brothers. Peace. It, it was ordered. It didn't always come. What else is Christmas about? Curtis. Ooh, even though it happened a long time ago, you can still accept it or reject it. It is something that requires some element of choice to believe in and accept or not. Anything else, Dave? Absolutely true. And Bill, I saw you wave. The Father keeping his promise. Now, is there any part of Christmas that is about making amends with friends or even enemies? Is there any part of Christmas that's about speaking to someone who's important to you? that you have not seen in a long time. Curtis, that's part of the piece. Ah, so now we're getting into action. What Christmas represents, does it take a stark, fully functional 
acceptance and belief to relate to the Christmas story and be a marveler and a mover and a messenger? How can you move on it and be a messenger if you don't believe in it? Pardon? As a deceiver, yes. We could be outside that. So when we sit down at Christmas to eat the meal with friends or family or others included, our meal today celebrates that, what do we do when the turkey or the ham and the food's at the table and we sit down before we eat? Say a prayer. Oh, of Thanksgiving. How come nobody talks about Thanksgiving at Christmas? No, I mean Thanksgiving literally. Just like we say thanks with the turkey in November. How come nobody talks about Thanksgiving in December? If we respond to Christmas, to the season of Advent, to the incarnation of God in Christ, if we respond to that, how come nobody talks about Christmas being Thanksgiving? They should. Christmas is paramount to the story of every Christian. It's paramount to the story of God's plan and to the salvation and the Savior, to the grace and mercy and to the reconciliation and redemption that comes through the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. At Christmas, is the world mindful of saying thanks to the Creator and the Master of all? No, rarely. Some people are, but rarely do we see it. Did anybody notice this year so far how many commercials on TV did not say Merry Christmas? Almost all of them. What one did? Pardon? Hallmark, Angie? Mm -hmm. Nissan went against all the marketing advertising executives and said Merry Christmas. And they said it in a way that was overtly bold. Now if we have Thanksgiving in this season of Advent, in this time of year, what might it look like? What might it look like? Could it be a retelling of the Christmas story? Retelling of the manger scene? The three rise men? Curtis. Advent is the multi-week, multi-day calendar that carries us through the day of Annunciation, the day of Ascension, the day of... God's, I didn't mean to say ascension, by the way. Um, it takes us through the calendar layout of the church's, Christian church, liturgical calendar. The season of Advent marks the plan, the plan being told to Mary, the plan being told to the shepherds, the plan, the birth, and all that came after it. Advent is that season of the year that goes weeks. Now, it might be very relevant for me to speak on the Advent season so that we know how it's viewed by the world in a non-religious manner, but also how it's viewed by Christians around the world. So in this time that we look at the incarnation of Jesus, the manly flesh from God. We have many things that we are buried in. Songs that aren't religious. TV movies that aren't always religious. Stores with Santa Claus. Presents. 
children whining and crying because they're not going to get their new $700 laptop at four years old. I actually met somebody who's dealing with that this week. And I probably shouldn't have laughed, but I couldn't help it. A four-year-old wanting that much horsepower in a computer. And the, the scary part is the child knows how to use it. In this time, in this season, as we go through it, we look at Jesus and we should not forget the giver's gift, God. The gift itself, as the video said, Jesus the Christ. And we should not forget the grace and the mercy, the salvation. We should not forget that we are different than those in the world who give presents for the sake of presents, who have forgotten about God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit. We shouldn't be thinking about just Ralphie not getting his BB gun for Christmas. We shouldn't be just thinking about George Bailey getting ready to jump off the bridge. We should be thinking about how come George hasn't, doesn't have to worry? How come the little boy doesn't have to worry about getting his Red Rider BB gun? We should be thinking and going back to the foundation of truth and knowledge. That is the word with a capital W. That is Jesus Christ. And when we remember Jesus as the centerpiece for the season of Advent... We should remember it in a spiritual way, in a relationship way. Now, as much as I was intentional years ago on the Easter sermon, when I said, we're all slackers, we don't do our job of going around telling everybody, look, Jesus is risen. He's risen indeed. I'm not doing that today, but I'm telling you that as marvelers, we should move towards sharing the message by becoming messengers. And that means Easter and Christmas. It means Pentecost. It means everything. The Christian celebrations all year. So Thanksgiving, think, look, point at it, share it with others. Share that Christmas is more than just a story. It's more than just a gift. I can imagine why presents became important. The three wise men brought presents. I can understand how we get to Bing Crosby Christmas songs. But I really have a hard time with Santa Claus and reindeer. Christmas sleighs are, are actually relevant. They're relevant from Central Europe a long time ago. Now, does anybody know where the story of Rudolph and the reindeer came from? Yep, Eileen. No, it was that era. Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer and the reindeer connected to the sleigh are all the very, very savvy marketing campaign of two executives of an ad agency to move Montgomery Wards above Sears and Roebuck. Now, other parts of Christmas are just as contrived and just as off course as that. But yet we bought in to a mythical story. It's not even a rumor. It's an outright lie. We bought into it. And we tolerate it. 
every day during the season of Advent. Today I ask you to, to consider saying thank you to God in a robust way, saying thank you to him for the plan, for Jesus, our salvation, and for the Holy Ghost that is our leader, our teacher, and the bringer of good news and truth. Say thank you to God and to Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Literally, in words, whether it's in your head, in your heart, or with your voice. But say thank you and acknowledge that tremendously huge gift and the sacrifice. For God so loved the world that he gave his only very special begotten son, and you know the rest of the verse. Thanksgiving. We need to remember it because it's a huge piece of worship. It's a huge part of our relationship with God.